Open your ears, O Christian people. That is what the Lord said to the churches, the seven churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now I'd like to have one more further Bible reading before we preach the word. And this time it's going to be from Ezekiel. You don't get too many readings from Ezekiel. It's a super book though. Probably needs a good commentary though. Ezekiel chapter 1 we'll devote our time to. And Ezekiel also had a vision of God. And again, you'll see similarities between his vision and that of John in Revelation 4. Reading in Ezekiel chapter 1, beginning at verse 4. I looked, and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud, both flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal, and in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance, their form was that of a man, but each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, their feet were like those of a calf, and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had the hands of a man. All four of them had, all four of them had faces and wings, and their wings touched one another. Each one went ahead, straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. Their faces looked like this. Each of the four had the face of a man, and on the right side each had the face of a lion, and on the left the face of an ox. Each also had the face of an eagle. And down to verse 22. Verse 22. Spread out above the heads of the living creatures was what looked like an expanse, sparkling like ice and awesome. Under the expanse, their wings were stretched out one towards the other, and each had two wings covering its body. When the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings, like the roar of rushing waters, like the voice of the Almighty, like the tumult of an army. When they stood still, they lowered their wings." Then there came a voice from above the expanse above their heads as they stood with lowered wings. Above the expanse over their heads was what looked like a throne of sapphire. And high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal, as if full of fire. And that from there down he looked like fire. And brilliant light surrounded him, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day. So was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down, and I heard the voice of one speaking. Remind you of Revelation chapter 4? Much of Revelation is in the Old Testament. And there's lots of cross-references all the time. Congregation. Just imagine you're sitting in the pews of one of the seven churches. Not just Australind, but in Ephesus, Philadelphia, Smyrna, Pergamum, Laodicea, perhaps. One Sunday morning, an elder gets up to read and announces that he has a new scripture to read. It's from John the Apostle, and it's come straight from the island of Patmos. He's received some visions directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone eases forward on their seats to listen. He begins to read. The first scene is a vision of Christ himself. It is an awesome picture of him. He is majestic, a king. We read that this morning from Revelation 1. And then the Christ dictates a letter to seven of the churches, and your church is one of them. These letters are like a report card from the head of the church, not the headmaster. 
commendatory, but also containing strong warnings of the weaknesses and sins of each congregation. Your sins are on public display for all to see. Frankly, it's embarrassing. They clearly show Christ knows all about them. All of them are struggling churches with one problem or another, persecution from heathen guilds, false apostles, wicked men, church leaders who are leading them into idolatry again, away from Christ, hostile Jews that act as synagogues of Satan. One church is even declared dead. Another has forsaken its first love to Christ. Another has grown complacent in its faith. Remember that one? Laodicea, ready to be spat out. Another tolerates false teaching. They had problems. It's all serious stuff and somewhat overwhelming. But the love of Christ for his churches shines out strongly as he calls his church to repentance and perseverance and gives spectacular promises to those who endure to the end. Indeed, the church must be aware of the spiritual darkness in the world of the first century as well as the 21st century and recognize that its light of faith can flicker at times when attacked by the forces of evil. And the congregations wonder, in whose hand is the future of the world and the church? Is it in the hands of Rome, Nero, the Caesars, the guilds? When you become a Christian, they kick you out, or you exit too because you've got to go to the temples and practice the prostitution that's there? Or more in our times, the Hitlers, the Stalins, atheistic governments, anti-Christian governments, extreme terrorism, other religions? Just who is ruling this world? Is it the US, the UK, Russia, China, the multinationals, Wall Street, Google, Facebook. The church of John's day and Christians today need to know as they suffer and are martyred for their faith in Jesus, as they see events occurring that don't seem to suggest that God is reigning. Just finished reading a book by Lyle Sheldon, who uh, is now replaced by Martin Isles, and the book is a uh, expression of his work in politics as a Christian leader for the last 20 years. It's depressing reading, very depressing reading. Not too many victories there for the church. So now there's time for a dramatic change of scenery where this question is addressed. John is suddenly whisked up to heaven itself. And the congregation, through John, is given a vision of God Almighty that reveals what's really going on in this world from heaven's perspective. And that's really the only perspective worth listening to, isn't it? You see, as a congregation... We are naturally caught up in the world around us, the activities in our families, our work, our congregation. Our minds seem to be taken to other things, not up there. Today it's another winter day in Australind, and we're still holding our breath to see if we discover in WA COVID positives that require another lockdown. We watch a COVID, we just finished watching a COVID affected Olympic Games and hear of numbers of infected people rising in many nations who thought they had COVID under control until Delta came along. You see, it's very easy to lose track of the reality of God 
heaven and eternity. We are children of the earth. And so much of our energies, physical, mental and emotional, are consumed by the challenges, the problems and decisions of the day. So also for these seven churches, as well as all the other churches that had been established by this time. And they also would receive eventually copies of this book of Revelation of Jesus Christ to John. So in Christ's love for his church, he now lifts its thoughts heavenwards to the world of God's reality, the reality of eternity. And we know why. To remind the church of the spiritual truth, the eternal truth, God's truth, God's amen, that he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. And so encourage, comfort us in the immediate struggles of life and death, truth and error, and faithfulness in bearing testimony to Jesus our Saviour. And in that sense, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan, in Nigeria, in China, and so many other nations where the church is specifically targeted for killing. Killing. We pray that those brothers and sisters may know this truth very, very clearly. In God's providence, it is this marvellous vision that we have before us this evening. You and I can look back on disappointments in our church. We are, we're a young church still. We're still a small congregation. We may feel that our influence in the community is minute. Somebody out there? Yep, that's okay. We struggle to find ways to increase our reaching out to the community with the gospel. So this evening, it is good for us to get fixed more firmly in our minds, history from God's perspective. John receives another vision beyond chapter 1. And he sees before him an open door into heaven. And Christ himself invites him to come up and enter with the express purpose of John knowing, quote, what must take place after this. That is the future of the churches. What John immediately saw was a throne in heaven and someone sitting on the throne. At this juncture, it might be appropriate to pause and briefly consider the whole book and its visions. Each vision is not reality. Rather, it is a symbolic picture, a vision, taken from Old Testament messages, prophets, stories, that convey the spiritual truths that the church needed to know. We've seen it already in the vision of the Christ figure. Read it this morning again. The figure, frankly, is quite scary. It's not how we know our Saviour. We think of him as a teacher or a shepherd. Nice guy. We don't see him as that majestic figure, burning bronze, light of his face, can't be look at it, full of glory. It symbolically reveals him, though, as the one of power and authority, a ruler. So also here. Soon Christ will appear, not in that form, but as a lion, and then as a lamb. You see, he has many figures of speech to describe various facets of his being. Further, each vision should first be seen as a whole. It has a single truth to convey. We are to see the forest, not the trees. So here the forest is a throne room. When one sitting on it, 
All other details of this vision add to the focus on that throne. In fact, the word throne is mentioned 13 times in those 11 verses. So you can see the significance of it. This is an easy vision to interpret. Now you know what a throne is and what it's used for, what kind of a person uses it. It's a king who rules from his domain on the throne. If you dethrone him, he loses his power and authority. And it is almighty God who sits there, revealed as the sovereign ruler of his creation. But note that John uses the word one, or sometimes translated someone. That is, he doesn't name him as Father, God, Christ at all. Yet it is clearly the divine person, God, because worship is given to him, beautiful worship by the 24 elders and the four beasts and all others in creation. Did you note also that Christ is not mentioned in this vision specifically? He is the one who is revealing the vision to John, so he's, as it were, standing next to him, but he's not in this vision. And remember that the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that leads me to say that our chapters have been divided, one, two, three, four, we've got 22 chapters in Revelation. That's not exactly how it was revealed to John. And the vision, the vision continues into what we call chapter 5. And chapter 5 is like a scene 2 of the same play or vision. And there Christ is the central person. But you have to wait until the 12th of December when I come down again, scheduled, and we'll hear that then. So it's not so much a picture of what is really in heaven, but a view of all that exists from the aspect of heaven. That is God's aspect and what he wants to reveal to his church. The throne reigns. God reigns. Let the earth tremble. That is the good news of this vision. They're human words with worldly symbols that we can understand. Utterly inadequate to describe God as he really is, but this is the scene chosen by God to reveal himself to John and his church on earth and us this evening. Now I need to read just again to revise and review chapter 4, verses 3 to 6a. If you've got your Bibles there, you can read that with me. In fact, it's good to keep it open. Chapter 4, verse 3 to 6a. Let's see where we are. 3. And there we read these words. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. So, from that, did you see the similarities with Ezekiel's vision? God uses the symbols of a rainbow and gemstones known for their brilliance, their shining brightness and preciousness, to reveal himself as he is. After all, you cannot see God, he is spirit. The sea of glass is the most difficult to interpret. There have been many explanations, but each lacks real clarity. The best that we can say with certainty is that the sea of glass enhances the majestic appearance of the one who sits on the throne. There is an emerald green translucent 
rainbow. That, of course, reminds you straight away of the covenant with Noah. But note that it is not a real rainbow. Why? Because it lacks all the colors. It's a green one. Yet it still reminds us of the special covenant of grace that he has made with his people. We're also reminded that the rainbow only appears after the storms have passed and calmness is restored. Comfort for the suffering church. That peace and calmness will surely follow their suffering. We're also, it is language that endeavors to capture the brilliant light and the radiance of the glory of the Lord, as Ezekiel saw. It is blinding to human eyes, as Ezekiel says. Quote, such was the radiance of the glory of Yahweh. And then John notes some details. He sees and hears flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder coming from the throne. You may know as little children, I often are a bit scared of that thunder, especially when it claps right overhead. And the dogs and cats usually run for their lives too. And usually we jump a bit too, don't we? It's a lot of noise. And even more impressive when it is all controlled by the one who sits on the throne. Of what might they be a symbol? Well, the words were originally used to describe the awesome presence of God coming down to speak the law to Israel on Mount Sinai. God used these natural phenomenon to reveal his grandeur, his holiness, and his power, and his glory. So also here. And right in front of the throne are seven blazing lamps, Another symbol, this one taken from the golden lampstand in the holy place of the temple and tabernacle that shed its light on the showbread. A symbol of God's spirit protecting, enlightening, and caring for his people. The 12 loaves representing the 12 tribes. And this one is interpreted for us. We're thankful for that. It says they represent the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit. Now, are there seven spirits or one? You know what Scripture teaches? There is one Holy Spirit. Why seven mentioned here? Well, seven is a number which repeats itself throughout Scripture and especially in the book of Revelation. And that number seven denotes perfection, wholeness, completeness. And he is the same Spirit doing the work in the church today, as he did in the temple long ago, protecting, enlightening, and caring for his people. Immediately surrounding the throne and making it even more glorious were four living ones. Ezekiel also saw them in his vision, and he names them later on in the book as cherubim, and that's where Psalm 99 speaks about, he speaks, he speaks between the cherubim, one of the higher order of angels. Their task is to render eternal worship to the throne. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Words that are very familiar to us in so many of our hymns. And we were able to sing one tonight. Further, it is another example of words taken directly from the Old Testament. From Isaiah's vision of God in the temple in the days of King Isaiah. God's earthly throne room. The tabernacle, the temple. Beyond them were 20 more, 24 more thrones on which were seated 24 elders. No interpretation given this time. So what do we do? We compare scripture with scripture. And look for other times when this, these numbers are mentioned. We know that elders, uh, we mentioned the Old Testament and in the New Testament. 
So that word was new. They were spiritual leaders in the church and in Israel. The number 24, when I went to school, it was 12 plus 12. Still is, I think. God's laws of mathematics haven't changed. And in the book of Revelation, we read that when the new Jerusalem is coming down from heaven, we read that it has 12 gates each one named after the 12 tribes of Israel and as having 12 foundations. And it says in chapter 21, with the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb inscribed on them. The same figure of the city descending from heaven, we have the 12 plus 12, Old and New Testament linked in the one city, the New Jerusalem. So it is good to be able to say, well, these 24 thrones, the elders and the thrones, represent the whole church, the whole church. And notice that they are reigning. They have thrones. Thrones reign. Did we not read this morning that those who are faithful in Laodicea, who repent and believe, are going to reign with Christ? Wow. There we have it. Soon we read what they do. They fall down before him who sits on the throne and worships him forever and ever with the words, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Who but the church of all ages would use such words of worship? How ready are you, congregation, to engage in such worship? It's a good yardstick to use to measure one's spiritual devotion to Christ. Would you be pleased to worship your God 24 hours a day, day and night? How keen are you to worship the Lord once a week on Sunday, twice a Sunday? Some say... I'll worship him when I have time, but I don't have time to go to church today. And some say, well, when I've got nothing else to do on Sunday, I'll go and worship him. I had a family in Kalgoorlie. Sunday school, a lady volunteered to do Sunday school work. Great, thank you. But when it came to um, uh, BMX sports on winter months, she bluntly told me, oh, look, we'll be missing for six months, Ross. We have, uh, have to go to BMX training with the boys. Come back after that. You see, a worship down here on earth is a preparation to what we'll be doing up there. And what do you really think the Lord's opinion is when he sees some of his people worshipping worshiping him as church and some occupying themselves with self-pleasing activities on the Lord's day? Worship is the supreme activity of heaven engaged in by those who know God with enthusiasm and energy and heart and lots of noise. Pentecostals will find it quite happy up there. We have to be too. We see the one on the throne, the king, viewed here in this vision as the creator of the universe and all that is in it, the sovereign God by whose will all things were created. In other words, the God who is in control of his creation, whose will is supreme. Nothing occurs without his will. Even the hairs on your head and the sparrows in the sky... Remember what Jesus taught us? That's the basic truth about creating something. The creator owns it and controls it. This is the creator God in whom his church can trust, believing that all circumstances come from their loving, heavenly Father's hand. Of course... We don't fully understand God's plan for our lives. 
And that is why our relationship with him is based on faith, trusting him. Faith that does not see the whole plan of God, but trusts him in all those circumstances. So also for the church of John's time, suffering persecution, losing its leaders, enduring pain and loss of goods. We haven't got that far, have we? Enduring the injustice of men, the insults and worse of their neighbours, having the peace of the church torn apart by false teachers and immoral people. The Lord Jesus Christ gives John and his church this high and true view of how things really are. The Lord God Almighty reigns. Let the earth tremble. Let the nations repent from their wickedness against their creator. Bow down before him. The Lord is his name. You see, man is not the ruler of this planet. He is only a creature with such limited power that it is hardly worth mentioning. It's like dust and a fine balance, and it's pretty small. Congregation, we are to order our thinking our conversation and their actions accordingly. The message of the vision is, don't mess with your creator. Worship him. He sits on the throne, ruling. But one day, he is returning on the clouds of heaven. Not as creator, not even as a saviour, but as judge. And that will be the great and dreadful day of the Lord spoken of throughout Scripture. The great and dreadful day of the Lord. In that day, you and I will need to have believed in him as Saviour and served him as best we can, diligently, unswervingly, single-mindedly, unless you're somebody like the thief on the cross who didn't have much time to worship his Lord and Saviour down here. But up there, he joined in wholeheartedly. Because on that day, that's what we want to do, congregation, because on that great day, we want to join the 24 elders, the church of all ages, casting down our crowns before his throne. And with all our heart, our soul, our mind and strength, confess you are worthy, O oh Lord and God, to receive the glory and the honour and the power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So what adjustments do you and I need to make in our thinking, in our lives, after com com contemplating this throne vision? Amen. Let's pray. We pray to you as the almighty God, the thrice holy one, perfectly holy, one whose majesty is beyond our being able to bear. We thank you, Lord, for the words that you use to describe yourself in Scripture. We understand their meaning in human terms, but they have such depth, Lord, that we cannot know you fully. But we do worship you, and we want to serve you with our lives. Again, we say, to that, say that to you again tonight. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we do want to serve you wholeheartedly with our lives. We want to know with confidence that you are the ruler of the governments of this world and all the evil in it you still control. The evil one cannot do anything more than you permit. You are indeed a sovereign God to be able to do all of that. Bless us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen.